Welcome to Aranzazu. We are almost on the top of a hill in the Franciscan monastery of Our Lady of Aranzazu. The monastery really leans as a balcony on a cliff, one of the many narrow and deep ones that pinpoint the valleys around Donati. We are still very much in the Basque countries, as you might recognize from the sounds of the place names. The sanctuary is actually located at the end of a road and its architectural modern Spanish style might strike the visitor today. Two tall square towers decorated with dark indented bossage, which runs also on the lower part of the facade and over the main doors, frame a bare and bone stone central wall that serves as the background for black sketched statues who in the intention of the artist portrayed the apostles. To enter the church one needs to walk downhill on a descent that brings the visitor to the level of the four squared and low main gates, providing you with a sense of heavy sense of mountaineer style and life. The interior is also very dark, but strikes because of the height of the nave. Since your point of view when you are out is higher, you cannot realize how tall the building is in fact is. In front of you, a cement apse with sketched figures carved or molded in different colors, from the very dark at the base to the thin and light gray at the top, where pure light enters. Certainly, the effect is theatrical and spectacular, but the depth and darkness of your feelings are completely changed when a machine that is, an elect that is electrically moved from a mid-air level floor behind the apse makes the little, tiny statue of Our Lady turning and appearing to the public, right in the center of the scenery over the altar, with lights all pointing to her. What a consolation. The contrast between the tiny wooden statue of the Virgin and the dark high space of the Basilica could not be bigger. If you find the Franciscan monk hanging around, please ask him to bring you behind the scene to take a closer look at the statue. When one accesses the stairs and the floors behind the haps, everything is light, comfy, colored. There, you can admire the details of a little Madonna that has attracted the devotion of thousands of Basques and pilgrims for centuries. The very name of this place, Aranzatsu, would possibly mean an exclamation like, you hear, among the thorns, an unexpected discovery. The story behind this is, as usual, very traditional. A young shepherd going after a missing cow in the woods how many legends and myths begin like this? Think about the Iliad, for example. Her bell rings, he turns and finds a sign of God, a little Madonna hiding in a thorny bush. According to the tradition, this young man was named Rodrigo Balzazzeghi, and this discovery happened just in 1468, not much before, if you think it carefully, Ignatius paid the, his visit to Our Lady of Aranzazu. Soon after the discovery, the sanctuary was by then a chapel, the statue began to attract pilgrims. A confraternity erected a monastery and then the Franciscans were entrusted with it. A dispute with the Dominicans was raised in the first decade of the 15th century, uh, but when Ignatius visited Aranzazu, uh, the sanctuary and monastery were again in the hands of the Franciscans. When Ignatius left Loyola, we don't know if his first plan was to pay a visit here but as a brother of his wanted to accompany him at least until Onyate, we know that Ignatius persuaded him to make a stop here at Aranzazu, where he meant to make a prayer vigil before the statue of the Virgin. This experience clearly marks a milestone in Ignatius's spiritual biography, as this vigil, and the benefits of it, as he claims, is explicitly mentioned in other early sources we can read still today. Based on Diego Lainez's biography of Ignatius, Lainez was an early companion of Ignatius and his successor as superior general of the society, and the modern biographer Candido Dalmases infers that it was here when Ignatius took the vow of chastity, for, as he says, as Lainez pointed out, 
whereas he had hitherto been attracted and overcome by the vice of the flesh, henceforth, from then till now, God has given him the gift of chastity and, as I think, in the highest degree. Whether Ignatius took a formal vow here or not, it is certain that Aranzazu played a role in orienting Ignatius' future life toward some unexpected direction. Writing to Francis Borgia in 1554, Ignatius informed him that the sanctuary of Aranzazu had burned down, and with the hope to see it rebuilt, Ignatius remembered his confrere about his experience of the place back when he was on his way to Montserrat. Ignatius says, the fire there was a great misfortune, especially for those of us who know the devotion the place inspires and the great service rendered there to God our Lord. Hence, whatever measures are necessary for the restoration of the monastery should be eagerly undertaken. I may tell you that I personally have a special reason for desiring this. When God our Lord granted me the grace to make some change in my life, I remember having received some benefit for my soul while watching by night in the nave of that church. Here in Aranzazu, this place that dwells in the unexpected, we find, once again, and like many times in his future steps in life, Ignatius adjusting to an unplanned situation, experience, discernment. We should think about Ignatius who sometimes has been depicted as a consistent planner whose decisions were there from the very beginning, really as someone who adjusts on the road, ponders and takes decisions and change along the way, always driven by the devotion he feels especially for Our Lady. Leaving Ognate and his brother there to reach the town of Navarrete, where he claimed some old debts back, he used those money as he says again in his autobiography, for an image of the Blessed Virgin that was deteriorated so it could be repaired and handsomely adorned. From the castle of Loyola to the sanctuary of Montserrat, many unexpected events are yet to come, but Ignatius feels safe under the protection of Our Lady. Get some rest after visiting Garantazu. Next stop is all the way down in Catalonia. We have to cross the regions of Navarra and Aragon, and then you will see a so-shaped mountain raising in the horizon, the holy mountain of Montserrat, where I will wait for you. Hello, pilgrims, and welcome, welcome everyone to Aransasu. This is a very special and amazing Marian shrine in Spain. And the church building itself is stunning. But actually, it's the interior of that church that's such a magnificent surprise, so unexpected. Given the prickly exterior that the architect designed the building for, it's a magnificent surprise to enter into the majestic interior of Aransasu. And when I first encountered it, I found that interior to be so very striking. And then the surprise of that little tiny image of Mother Mary high above the altar. I really love that place. Now, Professor Cristiano Casolini has already introduced you to Arantzazu. But I'm delighted to have an opportunity to reflect with you upon the theme that accompanies Arantasu for this week of pilgrimage. And that theme is the unexpected. This is a beautiful place for us to pause for our week on the journey. This is a week of surprise, of unexpected. We believe, as believers, that we live often in very interesting circumstances. On the one hand, each of us in everyday life must chart out possibilities. We need to, to plan and proceed in life with prudence for the future. And we need to make decisions about our lives and about the future of them. To not do so would be to be reckless and irresponsible. 
For example, here at Boston College, our students eventually have to choose majors. They have to choose activities to fill their time, and those activities, those courses that they choose, have an impact upon the trajectory of their future. In other words, in the earthly life, we have to be, in many ways, planners. Yet, on the other hand, at certain moments in life, we have unexpected circumstances that barge into our realities, interruptions that are not planned whatsoever and often not welcomed, that remind us that in many ways we're not really totally in charge of this earthly life. At any moment, things might shift dramatically, and we see ourselves faced with choices in how to respond to circumstances that were not initially on our radar at all. And we can choose either to resist those changes, or we can move along with what the changes bring with them. In other words, at certain moments in life, we find ourselves facing the unexpected, and how we respond to the unknown makes a very significant difference in the quality of life that we live. It's curious, isn't it? Most often, when we think of a surprise, it has a happy connotation. And when we think of the unexpected, it has an unhappy connotation. A surprise party. An unexpected loss. Well, this is a week of pondering on our pilgrimage the role that the unexpected has played or perhaps now is playing in our lives. In your quiet prayer and ponderings and musings of this week, you might use the gift of memory to recall those past moments in life where your plans shifted, both where life surprised you and where life interrupted and brought to you the unexpected. Here is the grace that we're seeking. In Arantasu, who would have ever thought that a thorn bush would eventually lead to a beautiful pilgrimage destination? In other words, are you open to the possibility that surprises and the unexpected, which are often prickly at first glance, contain within them the seeds of beauty, and they can become places of return, where we go to find strength and courage and perseverance. In other words, that these places of our past become points of deep reverence and places of gratitude and growth. You know, there's an awful lot in life that is simply out of our control. Important to note, and important for us to admit. In fact, there is a freedom that comes when we're able to name things that aren't within our capacity to control. There's no use in getting upset about the weather, for example, because there's nothing that you and I can really do about it. But there is an additional freedom that comes for us to claim, which is our recognizing that we are, in such circumstances, in complete control of how we react to and how we interpret all the events, all of the circumstances that life brings. I think that is why there is a bell with Mother Mary in Aranthasu to alert us to get our attention so that we recognize that there is more than meets the eye, that there's something greater than what currently is being revealed, something in store. In the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, we hear the Lord remind and reassure, for I know well the plans I have in mind for you. Plans 
for your welfare, not for woe, so as to give you a future of hope. When you call me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. When you look for me, you will find me. Yes, when you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, and I will change your lot. Very important. And we get this from St. Ignatius in his spiritual exercises. God never wills desolation for us. When life brings us unexpected prickly thorn bushes, it isn't because that's what God wills for us. Not at all. God's will is his love for us. It's because of freedom that God allows all of the mysteries of life to happen. And that's why we're often surprised and why we encounter the unexpected. It isn't at all that God's trying to teach us a lesson or to put us out into the thorny bushes of life. The plan of God for us is a future of hope. Ultimately, that future of hope is to be fully with him in the kingdom. We look forward to seeing you in Montserrat next week. God bless everyone, and enjoy this week of surprise and unexpected.